So, hello. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it's not even me you should be applauding. I'm just giving the introduction. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you all to the Slack Public Lectures. Uh, this installment will be about the material world. It'll be given by uh, Rob Moore, who is uh, one of our staff members here. Rob got his uh, undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Tennessee Tech. Then he went into the Navy and spent two years in a submarine. And from that experience, whatever it does to you, decided to go into physics. He has his PhD from the University of Tennessee and he came here in 2006 to work at our X-ray laboratory. Now he's the assistant director of SIMES, which is the SLAC Stanford a laboratory for materials research and energy research. And he's going to tell you about the future of materials. So let me introduce Rob and uh, let's please watch. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Ah, oh, my public, I love it. So, um, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for the introduction, and you know it's a thrill to be here, and it's 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 going to be a lot of fun talking about some of our latest research and some of the things that we're doing here at the lab. Now, there there is one thing though, you know, I I would also like to thank Slack Communications for hosting the event, and they also made our our nice wonderful poster here. Now, but I, I do have to you know wonder you know with the materials theme and the material world and 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 all of the fashions, you know, I just wanted to to make it sure you're aware that, you know, we're not bringing back the 80s. That's not where we're going, okay? So, you know, I, find, I kind of felt like we should have a disclaimer down here. So just to make sure it's, it's, it's not going to be the 80s. But, you know, I did actually request sort of a, a, a poster with a fashion theme because my daughter's actually here watching me tonight. And um, so that means that I'm actually competing with her cell phone and the games on it. So I'm trying to have something that sort of appeals to her fashion sets. So we'll see how I pull it off. We'll see how it works. So now, when you think of a material world, what, what, what images come to your mind? I mean, do you think about Madonna being a material girl in a material world? Yes. All of the fashions and, and all of the trends and latest gadgets and all of the stuff that we fill our lives with? Or do you envision some sort of world to where the boundary between technology and, and human existence is becoming so narrow that it's blurred as we, you know, go through and scour under every other rock around the earth trying to find that last ultimate material, unobtainium. So, you know, these are, are pretty extreme examples, but, you know, but we can't think about for a second what is the boundary between technology and our lives. And so how far away are you from a technological device? So think about it. even when you're sleeping, I mean, you may have a cell phone on your nightstand, maybe your alarm clock. What about a pacemaker? And so it comes down to it that technology is everywhere and everything that you see comes down to being built out of something that was made from superconductors. I mean, not superconductors, but semiconductors. And so, you know, it's, and so that's what we'll be talking about tonight. And so for me, you know, I like to know how things work. And so that's the physics background. But I also like to build things. I like to build things that can make an impact on the world around us. And so that's the engineering background. And so, you know, when I go to dinner parties, people often ask me, well, what is it I do? And, you know, it's kind of hard to explain, you know, within the, the few minutes that are typically allowed for a casual conversation at a dinner party. But, you know, now, you know, I have your attention for an hour and I've got slides. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, this is what we do. All right. So this will be fun. So, so there's basically two sides to my job. One of them is making materials. And then the other one is actually looking at the electronic structure of the materials by shining light on it. Now, this seems rather straightforward, right? But, but let's dig just a little bit deeper. But I want to start with just a very brief history to kind of give us sort of a perspective of where we're going and, and what materials mean to our lives. So about 3.3 million years ago are the first historical records of rudimentary tools made out of stone. 
Now, Stonehenge was made around 3000 BC. And so what does this mean? So it takes about 3.3 million years for us to go from very rudimentary, simple objects to being masters of stone, from rudimentary to ornate. About 3.3 million years to become masters of all things stone. But then about 6,000 BC, we learn how to smelt copper, extract copper metal from, you know, ore that we find in, in shallow mines and such. And so then about 3000 BC, we actually learn how to take copper and mix it with tin to form bronze. Now bronze has an age made, you know, named after it simply because, you know, bronze is a strong enough material to where you can make very, you know, useful farming implements, hunting tools, weapons for defense. And so, you know, that, that's what really gives it its age. And so that was about 3000 BC. And then we come up to about 1200 BC to where we can actually learn how to start working with iron. We developed the technologies to hot work iron, control the carbon content. And so this is a situation to where we can get to the point to where we can make just about anything that we want out of metals. And so while this spans several different ages, this takes about 5,000 years from rudimentary to becoming masters of every, all things metal. 5,000 years. Now, the end of the Iron Age is, is, you know, was with the development of writing as we go from prehistory to history. But from our perspective, as we actually start looking at the journey of different materials and, and how they impact our lives, then we need to come to semiconductors. And so semiconductors, the, the very first idea of a transistor started to appear in the 1930s. And semiconductors really started to have some sort of practical applications in radar technologies in the 40s. So, but it wasn't until 1947 when the very first transistor actually became a reality. And so from that, we actually go from 47, in the mid-70s, we actually start having a lot of computer technology. And then in the mid-80s, we start having the internet, the propagation of all of these internet service providers, and the birth of the information age. And so semiconductors from the very first devices made out of just a chunk of, of a semiconductor all the way to masters of all things semiconductor, about 60 years. So to get an idea of today's materials and sort of the development cycle for ma today's materials, let's talk about something that we call giant magnetoresistance. Now this is a material property to where you actually can change the resistance of a material by small changes in a magnetic field. Now this is one of the key technologies that allowed us to shrink hard drives down to write smaller and smaller bits and to read smaller and smaller bits in magnetic media. And so we go for about 10 years in 1997 is the first hard drives with a GMR head. And then in 2006, we actually start having micro drives small enough that we can fit in, you know, pocket held devices. Now, I really like this picture because it's cute. <laughs> but I pulled it off the web several years ago. And so by now, the chicken has already flown the coop. And I'm not talking about the chicken. So this is a situation to where now, today, we actually have solid state hard drives that far exceed the capacity of a lot of these, these magnetic media, but it's based on a completely different material technology. But this is sort of where we are today. Now, to gain some perspective, does everybody remember these? Raise your hand if you know what this is. Wow, yeah, all right. Maybe this is going to be the 80s night. All right, I love it. So floppy disks. So these were all the rage back in the 80s. And so the floppy disk, if we actually think about, well, how much information can we store here compared to the floppy disks? And well, it's about 750,000. Now, if we actually stack all of these floppy disks up here on the stage, it would fill a box that's about 10 feet wide, 10 feet long, and 12 feet high. But what's even more interesting is the simple fact that that box of information would weigh more than eight Toyota Camrys. It's hard to believe that our information weighs that much. So as we look at this brief evolution of materials and how it impacts our lives, there's two things that I really want you to take home. 
One of them is that the time between materials discovery and becoming masters and implement, implementing that material, that time is shrinking exponentially. Now, the other thing that I'd really like to point out is the fact that fashions have dramatically changed along with the materials and the technologies. So, I mean, I would really, I feel sorry for the person who had to wear this hat. I mean, that had to be an uncomfortable. And the shirt, you know, that's a great looking shirt, but I just don't see me being able to pull that off. I just don't think I could do it. So, as we go through the history and we come up to today, and so, as we look at today, what are we in the state of the art? Now, there are a number of different materials that are emerging in different technological markets today. You have electronic devices, flexible devices, sensors, batteries, wearable devices, smart building materials. And so a whole vast array of different materials that are coming on the market and making a dramatic impact on our world. And today I'm actually going to talk about three of these. One of them is in the optoelectronics industry to where you can think about coupling light and all the information that you can carry with light. Think of fiber optics and how we couple that with our electronic devices. The other one is, is regarding smart windows. These are windows that can change the transparency to, with the flip of a switch in order to help save energy. And last is actually trying to look at superconductors. And so trying to figure out how to make better materials, better wire, better you know, transport, energy transport materials. And so if we can actually find a superconductor, we could save the world trillions of dollars of wasted energy just due to the resistance that are in the wires today. But the next generation, the next age, is going to be down at the level of atoms and electrons. And so when you get down to this level, there's actually many more exotic properties that are out there. We have superconductivity, but we also have things like topological insulators, multiferroics, thermoelectrics, photovoltaics, photonics, spintronics, catalysis. There are a lot of very exotic and interesting properties that happen at the level of atoms and electrons. And the key is, is how can we capture those properties and make useful devices and interesting things out of them. But to start to do that, we have to ex understand them on the most fundamental of levels. So how do we actually make these materials and how do we you know, look at these exotic properties? So here at SLAC, we've actually developed a program that is dedicated to the in investigation of fundamental material properties that actually generate and are responsible for all of the exotic properties that we see that are not only interesting from a fundamental perspective, but could actually be useful for something we could do something with. Now, this is a program that is actually a collaboration between two different divisions or, or a, a user facility and the, the material science division here at SLAC. And so this collaboration, we have SIMES, the material science division at SLAC, which is actually looking at the growth of these materials. And then SSRL, the user facilities to where we can actually map out the electronic structure. And so some of the people in the audience, you, you might actually recognize this instrument here because it was one of the instruments on the recent global physics photo walk. And so this is a photo walk to where amateur and professional photographers tour the different labs and take pictures of certain instruments. And so one of our instruments was the highlight, but it didn't win. I know. I'm just going to have to get over that because, I mean, we have by far the prettiest instrument here at Slack. I mean, but anyway, I'm just going to have to get over that. And so Slack is a Department of Energy National Lab. And, of course, this program is funded also by the Department of Energy. This is your national lab. This is what we are doing for you. So let's dig a little deeper and let's have some fun. So let's see if we can understand how materials work on the level of atoms and electrons. Let's start with the atom. So in the atom, you have a nucleus that's formed of, of protons and neutrons, and protons are positively charged, and electrons are negatively charged that actually orbit around the nucleus. And you can see that the electrons are much, much lighter than the protons, even though the charge is of the same magnitude. Now, these electrons take on different energy levels inside the atom. And so, you know, the, the, the higher the orbit, the higher the energy, the, you know, the more energy the electron has as it whizzes around the nucleus. But in addition to that, 
We normally think about, you know, an electron when it orbits, you know, the nucleus, we often think about, you know, an analogy with the, the planets orbiting the sun or the moon orbiting Earth. But here, the electrons actually have very strange shaped orbits. And the higher the energy level you go, the more different types of orbits you can actually find the electron in. So for now, let's just think about the simplest of these orbits, the s orbital, which is just a spherical cloud of charge, if you will. Now think about this as, as a cloud, simply because um, if you ask, well, where is the electron? Well, then you can find it, say it's right there. But if you don't ask, where's the electron? Well, you'll never know, because it's at all places in the cloud at all times. Now I know that sounds kind of strange, but that's just quantum mechanics for you. And so, you know, I, I know it's weird, but you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of cat lovers in the audience, and so I'm not gonna go into detail about what Schrodinger proposed to do to his poor cat, you know, in a thought experiment, trying to explain the quantum phenomena. So we'll just think of this as clouds for now. And so if you actually have several atoms together with these overlapping clouds, and you, you know, this electron right there, if you found one right there, which atom does it belong to? It's hard to tell. What about here? You just don't know. You can't tell, and the electron can't tell. And so if you find an electron here, then you, know, you can't tell what atom it is, and so it's just a, basically a cloud of charge that has these periodic array of atoms inside. And so in these conditions, the electron is just free to move throughout the material, just wherever it wants to go. But now what about here? So in this situation, you know, if you find an electron right there, well, it belongs to that atom. But if you find one in here, well, it, it's, it's hard to tell. But these are different, you know, these are representing the p orbitals. And so the different orbitals have different sizes, different shapes, and different overlaps. And so in this particular condition, if you have an electron here, it kind of hops from one atom to the next. Now you can tell that it would be easier to hop in one direction than the other. And so the orbits actually play an important role in determining how the electronic structure works, how the electrons actually move through the material. So when we start making materials, we can start taking our atoms, and then we start taking all these different kinds of atoms and start moving them next to each other, and you have all of these overlapping energy levels. And what we end up with is something that we call an energy band. Now, when you think of an energy band, think of it in terms of like a road map. And so what this does is, is it's energy band in momentum and in energy. So, you know, an electron right there, it's basically saying that it's moving in a particular direction with a particular mass and a particular speed through the material, and it takes that much energy for that to happen, for that electron to do that. And so just think of the energy bands as, as a road map, if you will. Now the shape of, this inner, the, the shape of these, electron, uh, these energy bands are actually determined by the types of atoms we have in our material and the locations of the atoms. This is what kind of generates the shape of these energy bands. So now we have all of these energy bands, we have all of these electronic states, but each atom only has a certain number of electrons in it. And so there's always going to be some you know, empty states that are of the same energy. And our little example here, you know, the p orbitals can hold up to six electrons, but there's only one right up here. So there's a bunch of extra states in which you could put electrons and they would be at the same energy as this. And so what this means in our materials, while you can think of this as a roadmap, it's kind of a strange roadmap. And the fact that if you add another electron, you know exactly where it's gonna go. It's gonna go to the lowest energy state that's not occupied by some other electron. And so it's a strange roadmap, but it always fills up from the bottom up, up to the maximum level. And the electrons that have the maximum energy at the very top, we call this the Fermi level, or the Fermi energy. Now I show here also the fact that, you know, the electrons have spin to it. You can kind of see, in, you know, the arrows pointing up and arrows pointing down. Now spin, think of it as, you know, the magnetic moment of the electron. And so if you have a material to where you have electrons that are on all of the atoms, then they're all pointing in the same direction, you're gonna generate a net magnetic moment, and this is a magnet, just like on your refrigerator. 
However, if you actually have them to where they're pointed the opposite way, then this is an antiferromagnetic. And so these spins actually determine the magnetic properties of the material itself. So when we actually have these energy bands and we actually have the Fermi level that cuts through one of these energy bands so that you have unoccupied states just right above the occupied states, then you have a situation to where the electrons can actually use these little unoccupied states to kind of hop through or, or freely move through the materials. And so in these particular cases, these are metals. Now, if you have a situation to where the Fermi level is actually between these two energy bands to where you have all of this band here, which is occupied, but this band, which is completely empty, then you're going to have to have a certain amount of energy to kind of jump the gap and to go from one road to another road. And so we call this a band gap. And in this situation, none of the electrons can move because there's no free states for them to move in. And so this is an insulator. And so the filled states, we call it the valence band up here to where if you could put electrons up there, they would move around. We call this the conduction band. Now, if the gap is small enough to where if you have just a little bit of heat or just add a few extra electrons in it, then it's going to start to conduct electricity, then this is what we call a semiconductor. Now, we've been talking about some toy models here, and it's, it's fairly, you know, um, simple to go you know, with, the, with the toy models, but as you start looking at real materials, things get really complicated really quick. And so this is actually a, a theoretical calculation of the band structure of the roadmaps of a particular material and showing the energies and the momentums of, of the electrons as they go in different directions, in different momenta through the material. So things can get pretty complicated really quick. Now we talked about heat and how it can sometimes add energy to electrons. So what is this? So we have what we know is, is, is phonons. Now think of the lattice as an array of just balls connected with springs. And so what happens if you just whack that array of atoms right there? What's going to happen? Well, you're going to have this wave that just starts propagating through this chain of, of atoms and springs. And so all of these different ways the atoms can move, all of these different waves that propagate through, these are different phonon modes. And so this is how the lattice can actually transmit energy through the system. Now for more complicated materials to where you actually have a lot more complicated structures inside the materials, then the phonons are going to be even stranger and more complicated as you actually have sort of a, a, all of these different atoms moving in concert together representing these different phonon modes. So phonons are how sound propagates through material, and it's how heat propagates through <coughs> material. Uh-oh, there. So what types of players do we have? So we have the band structure, and the band structure is determined by the position of the atoms and the types of atoms that are in our material, and then we have all of these players that actually influence the electron. The charge of the electron, the spin, which orbital it is, it is in, and all of this lattice energy. All of these things can influence how the electron behaves. But there's one other player, and I already gave you a hint of it, there's one, there's one other player which we haven't talked about yet, which is critical to our story here, and that is light. And so electrons can absorb light, and electrons can emit light. So now that we know the players, what is the game? So the idea is we talk about being able to look at materials and control materials on the atomic level with atomic precision. So how do we do that? And so we do that by using a technique called molecular beam epitaxy. And so molecular beam epitaxy, just think of boiling, boiling water in a pot. So as you heat the water up, you start to form steam, and steam comes out the spout. So what we do is we have something similar to this. We have little small pots where we put really pure materials inside. Then we stick these pots inside of a chamber and pump out all of the air. And then we just heat up the pots of different materials and out comes our atoms. And so we shine these atoms on some sort of crystalline substrate. Some of these things come on and just bounce off and absorb. And some of them hit the surface and they'll start rattling around until they find an ideal crystalline position to where they can have a chemical reaction to form the new material that we're trying to form. And so in this way, we can actually start with the substrate and start growing materials layer 
by layer by layer. Now, the neat thing about this technique is the fact that we can stack up atoms in so many different configurations. And, you know, so it's... Um, and so we can you know, start looking at you know, how to control all of these properties, and we can actually make things that you're just never going to find in nature. And so that's the beauty with this technique. But now, one of the things that we need to do is to understand you know, the electronic structure of these materials. Now, this is a very well-established technique. A lot of the semiconductors and a lot of the technology that we know today you know, has roots in a lot of these thin film techniques, and molecular beam epitaxy is one of them. But there's a caveat, is we normally can't look at a lot of the materials created by MBE, we can't directly look at the electronic structure. And it's not because of a material problem, it's actually because of the electron itself. And so when we're trying to look at, at the behavior of the electrons, the electrons of the material, if they come out, if you actually take the material out and take it out into atmosphere, then all of the atmospheric contaminants, moisture, CO2, CO, hydrocarbons, anything that's going to sit on the surface, it may not affect the material, but it's going to destroy the signal that we're trying to measure. And so that's the trick, is how do we get around that? So let's look at the flip side of our program. How do we actually look at the electronic structure? And so at the synchrotron, at SSRL, so we take a, a long chain of um, electrons, um, let's say about a meter long, and then we accelerate these to really close to the speed of light. Now, from our perspective, sitting in the laboratory, this whole chain of atoms gets shrunk to just a fraction of its original size. And this is relativity. And so, as we whiz the, these bunches of electrons around the ring, in certain sections of the ring, we pass them through a series of magnets that are, you know, oriented opposite of each other. And so what this does is the magnetic field actually interacts with the electrons and they start to oscillate as they move through the undulator. Now remember I said that you know, electrons can actually emit light. As it turns out, whenever you accelerate charge, it radiates light. And so we use that simple fact by having these high energy electrons go through our undulators and by controlling how they oscillate, we can actually generate high intensity X-ray beams with specific energies. And then we just take these uh, beams of light and just shine it onto our sample. Now as we shine it onto our sample, then you know, the, the, the photon can come in, which is just a quantum of light, and it can actually you know, couple with the electron, the electron absorbs the energy, and it can jump to a higher energy state. Now the caveat is, is, the, phone, is the, the, the quantum of light, or the photon it absorbs, is actually equal to the difference between those two energy levels. Now, the opposite can happen. If you have an atom that has an electron in an excited state, as it decays back down to that ground state, the state of lowest energy, it can emit photons as it actually jumps from energy level to energy level. And so the game that we play is we actually shine the x-rays onto our sample and we actually look at how much of the, the photons are absorbed and we actually can look at you know, how much of the photons are actually emitted afterwards. And what this does is it tells us about the electronic structure and, hello. Okay, all right. Don't go to sleep now, all right. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, intermission I guess, right? Okay, so, um, and so what we do is we can actually collect, you know, the photons coming out and we can look at how much of the x-rays are actually absorbed and it tells us about the electronic structure, the energy space in between the different levels of the atoms inside the material. Now there's a lot of different flavors of this technique and the ones that we're talking about today, one of them is called x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. This is basically where we take a photon, it excites an electron to an excited state, but this electron has so much energy, it just leaves the material. And as it leaves the material, we actually collect it and resolve how much energy it had below the Fermi level. And so you can see it, it has very distinct fingerprints, and these are distinct spectroscopic signatures of the materials that we're looking at. 
And then X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we actually sweep the, uh, the uh, energy of the incoming light and look at how much of the energy is actually absorbed. And this is another way in which we can actually look at the electronic structure and the spacing between the actual energy states and the positions of the atoms inside the material. There's one other technique that we'll be talking about, angle resolve photoemission spectroscopy. Now this is a situation to where we shine our light on the material. The electrons have so much energy that they just fly out of the material. And then we pass those electrons through our detector and actually map them onto a two-dimensional sort of CCD camera, if you will. And so on our CCD camera, we have one axis that's energy and then the other axis is momentum. Now we can stack all of these plots together to generate a multi-dimensional representation of the electronic structure inside the material itself. Now if you actually look at, at, at here up at the, the Fermi level here, if you actually look at the multidimensional map of the Fermi level, these are all the states and we call this the Fermi surface. This is the, the, all of the electronic uh, uh, states that are at the uh, um, maximum energy. In a multidimensional space it becomes a surface and so this is a, a, uh, a Fermi surface. Now, we know that the players are very limited. The number of players that actually interact with the electron are very limited. But we do need to think about a bit of perspective here. And so in order to get some perspective, let's think about a, a one centimeter cube of stuff. You know, just one centimeter or just some other little shape that you want to actually think about that's one centimeter cube. And then ask yourself, you know, well, how many atoms are in here? That's a lot of atoms. Now for metals, you're going to have a very similar number of electrons in there as well. Free electrons, to able to move around. But now electrons are all negatively charged and they repel each other very dramatically. And so if you have all of these electrons in there that are repelling each other and squeezing them into the space, it doesn't take too much in intuition to, to realize that strange things are going to happen. And so if we want to actually think about what is going to happen, we have all of these different interacting particles, and this is what we call mini body fixes, because there's so many of them. But now out of this, you can actually get collective modes. You can actually get sort of, of, of you know, uniform behavior for all the individuals. Now, and since this is, you know, 80s night, you know, in order to try to understand this concept, you know, I thought I'd help, you know, bring someone in to help explain what this concept is and what do you mean by collective excitations and collective modes. And so, you know, without further ado, you know, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Madonna. Uh, I'm sorry, is this on? Hello? Uh, guys in the control booth, did Madonna not get our invitation? No? No? Oh, okay. Um, so, well, I guess she's not going to be here tonight. But nonetheless, you know, she still helped us explain what it meant by collective behavior. Because as soon as I said her name, everybody's eyes went to the door. And so just a very small amount of interaction, we can have a room full of individuals that all did the exact same thing. This is what we mean by collective behavior. Now out of this collective behavior, you can actually have a lot of emergent properties that form in the material. And these emergent properties is what generates a lot of the exotic things that we see in the material physics. And we want to learn how to understand them and be able to control them. So in our materials, we actually look at the electrons coming out, but our their detectors are so sensitive enough that we not only look at the energy and the momentum of the electron coming out, but we can have indications, fingerprints, of how all of these different parameters affect the electronic uh, structure, how it affects the behavior of the electrons inside the material. And so these are the emergent phenomena, the collective information and the collective modes that we're actually looking at in the materials. And, and what does this look like? So this, this has very different shapes and fingerprints and such in our, our, our data. You can appear as band gaps. You can look at band kinks. You can have shifts of spectral intensity. You can have folded bands. You can have split bands. You can have replica bands. And all of these things are indications of the different players that are influencing the behavior of the electrons 
to generate these exotic properties that we see. And so at SSRL, we take the latest and greatest RPES synchrotron, we shine the light down it and, and shine it onto our samples, and this is how we actually map out the electronic structure of the materials itself. But now, in order to look at a lot of the thin films that we're growing via molecular beam epitaxy, we combine these two techniques together. And so this is a massive system, but we actually have growth systems here to where we can develop different films, and then we move them just straight into our RPES system to where we can map out in very precise detail the electronic structure of the materials. And so with that, I would like to take um, some time to actually look at some of our results. So now that we've seen what the electronic structure is and how can we measure it, what does this mean? What are some things we can do with it? So the first little story here is, is something that, you know, I'd like to talk about smarter than you think, Windows. And so what this is, that these are electrochromic nanocomposite nickel oxide materials. Now try to say that one 10 times in a row really fast. I'd like to see that. So what these are is these are basically, these are materials that, that'll change color when you apply a voltage. And so the idea is you can coat them on windows. And so, um, and this is something to where, you know, if, if it's a hot day, you can flip a switch, it blocks the sun, and it's nice and cool inside. So these are, are, are you know, uh, used for smart buildings in order to help save energy. Now the material, the material study in this particular case was lithium nickel tungsten oxide. And this is a collaboration with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to where they actually made the materials and then we investigated them at uh, SSRL. And just to give you a scale, the, the actual material is right here, the little color green, and it's about 80 nanometers thick. So this is the X-ray spectrum that we actually got from the materials. Now you can kind of see that, that you know, the top curves look kind of like each other, the bottom curves are pretty close to each other, but comparing the two, they're just completely different. And the same with our XPS spectrum, it just looks like different materials. And so with this, it, this actually reminds me of um, one of my favorite science quotes, and it's actually by a, 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 a scientific or a science fiction writer. And the quote is, you know, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, but that's funny. <laughs> now, this was kind of weird. We weren't expecting this. But now what's even more weird is this peak right here. I mean, that's just strange. Why is that there? That just doesn't make any sense. What is that? And so the, what it turns out is the, techniques, the techniques that we were using are very surface sensitive. XPS, and if you look at the total electron yield of X-ray absorption spectroscopy, is very surface sensitive. And so as we would start to cycle these materials, start to add charge, take charge out, then it actually started to form lithium peroxide on the surface. And this peak here is a very unique fingerprint for lithium peroxide. It can't be anything else. And so what this is telling us is we actually start looking at sort of a charged and discharged state or a transparent and, and opaque state, then we're starting to form this lithium peroxide on the surface. And so what happens, then the lithium comes from inside the material to form lithium peroxide on the surface. And then as we start to discharge it, the, the, um, or, or charge it back, I guess, the lithium peroxide dissolves and the lithium goes back into the material. And so what this does is it actually shifts the amount of charge inside the material, which actually, you know, generates some extra states inside the material that allows the absorption of light. So we learned from a very fundamental level what makes it change color and why. But also what's interesting about this particular case is the fact that the, mo the, the movement of charge, the movement of lithium ions into and out of the material and the formation of lithium peroxide this is exactly like a lithium air battery. And so what we're saying is we have an auto tinting window that acts like a battery. You shine the light on it, it changes how many electrons like to hang out on the nickel, changing the number of states available for the absorption of light, but also it's, it's acting just like a solid state lithium air battery. So let's take just a second and, and kind of go from the world of science into science fiction and, and what does this mean? So let's envision we have a small building or a house that has lots of glass on it. 
and let's put solar cells on top of the building. So as the sun comes up, the solar cells will start to generate energy, and it gets the hot part of the day, your solar cells will generate so much energy that you don't know where to put it. Where are you going to stick it? Stick it in your windows. So as the sun goes up, the heat comes in, you store the charge in the windows to help minimize how much heat is getting inside the building, and then as the sun goes down and your solar cells are starting to generate less charge, you can just pull the charge out of the, the windows, and they become clear again in the evening. Now this is pure science fiction, this doesn't exist. And a lot of it is, is probably because capacities, there's only gonna be so much charge. You could store in windows and you know, buildings require a lot of energy to operate. But nonetheless, this is something to where a lot of the latest battery storage technologies, these, this type of scenario is on the horizon but it's gonna be much better than this. So let's take a look at our next little example, but now for this one, we have to take a short quiz. Yeah, I know, you gotta love it, right? So what are these things? Should I start asking questions and pointing to people? So remember our energy bands? So we have our energy bands, you know, occupied, unoccupied states. Now, the way that we draw this is necessarily so. I mean, there's no reason that these things have to be lined up with each other. And so if we have a situation like this, and you know, we shine a photon on this, well then we can actually excite an electron into this energy level. And the reason for this is because the photon has negligible momentum compared to the electron. And so it can generate these atomic transitions, these energy band transitions, but it can't change direction, which means this has to be a straight line up and down. And so on this side, we can actually generate a transition, but you require a much more energetic photon, one with much shorter wavelength, much more energy to reach from this state all the way up to there. And so is, is there no way, if we say we only have this wavelength of, of, of photons, is, is there no way we can actually get over to those states? It turns out there is. And this is how we can start thinking about electron phonon coupling, how the electrons and all these lattice vibrations couple together. Now one way to think about electron phonon coupling is to actually start with the Hamiltonian and then, you know, let's not think about it this way. <laughs> let's think about it this way. Oh yeah. Let's think about the physics of the alley-oop. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I don't care who you are, these guys are impressive. It just, it's awesome. So if you think about the, the, the idea of an alley-oop, you have one player that just lobs the ball up somewhere close to the goal, and then you have another player comes over and just finishes the job. So let's think about this in perspective of electrons. And so let's just think of the basketball as our electron. And so, you know, one player, it goes up, you know, it has the energy to make it, it has the distance, but all of a sudden a phonon comes by and just makes it change direction and goes into the state that we want right through the basket. And so this is sort of what we mean by electron phonon coupling. So we have a situation, a photon comes in, it starts to excite an electron, but then all of a sudden a phonon comes by and just gives it a push of momentum to actually make it over into this state. And so now this is possible, however it takes a, a really concerted effort of the phonons, the lattice, the electron, the light. And so it's possible, but it's just a very low probability of it actually happening that way. Not when it is compared to something like this. Now in our sort of loose basketball analogy here, you know, a direct band gap transition is something to where you can envision yourself right above the basketball goal. Now I cannot play basketball, but I could probably make that shot. <laughs> And I could probably make it most of the time. <laughs> and so this is a situation to where, you know, you don't need any change of direction. It's just a straight energy shift without changing the direction of the electron. Now, the neat thing about quantum mechanics is this is actually backwards. The scenario that we're actually talking about, you would have to envision the basketball setting on the floor, all of a sudden getting light, absorbed a photon, and then it just jumps up through the hoop right into your hands. And that's the cool thing about quantum mechanics because this is how energy is exchanged on the quantum mechanical level. 
And so this is a direct band gap transition, and if it's over to the side, we call that an indirect band gap transition. And so for these next materials, transition metal dichalcogenides. And so these are materials that are very interesting because if you look at a material that's just one layer thick, then you have this very large nonlinear response to light. Now this is PL means photoluminescence. So this is basically a technique to where you absorb, you know, you shine light on a particular wavelength, it, the electron excites up and then it comes right back down for that energy. It's just a straight direct transition. And so you can see for one layer, you have this very large response to the light. But if you grow it two layers thick or thicker, nothing happens. It, it just doesn't, you know, the, the light just doesn't do anything to it. Now theory has suggested that this is actually responsible, this is actually due to a transition from an indirect to a direct band gap as you shrink down this material to one layer thick. And so if we actually, so we grew some of these materials, and if we actually look at some of our data, now this is eight layers of molybdenum diselenide. And so here is our RPES spectrum. Now one of the tricks that we do in order to understand, because here you have a situation where here's the valence band maximum, but you don't see anything up here because our Fermi level is inside that gap. Now one of the tricks that we do is we take just a little bit of potassium and sprinkle it on the surface. Now potassium is an alkali metal, and so it has one electron in its outermost shell, and it doesn't like to be there. So as soon as you put the, the alkali metal on the surface, the electron jumps off and actually goes into the material. So we're actually shifting the position of the Fermi level due to adding this potassium. And so when we do this and take a look at our spectrum, then all of a sudden you can see the bottom of this conduction band right there up at the Fermi level. But now you can see that, yeah, these are not lined up with each other. This is an indirect band gap. But now as we actually shrink this thing down to one layer and do the same trick where we add potassium on it, then all of a sudden you can see this is a straight shot from the valence band maximum to the minimum of the conduction band. And you can see what happens is just the shape of these bands actually change as you shrink down to one single layer, one single unit cell of the material. But now something else I want to point out is the fact that you see the little blue arrow and a little red arrow here. That's because this band, the spins of one orientation and the spins of a different orientation have different energies. And this has to do with the symmetry inside the material, but the splitting of spin states can even be observed inside our spectra. Now, these, these is interesting, not only from just a fundamental materials perspective. This is a situation to where you can actually think about using these types of materials and devices, because we can expand the bandwidth and the efficiency in our optoelectronics, the coupling of the information that's inside light and how it interacts with our actual devices. These can actually improve, greatly improve on the level of quantum mechanics, greatly improve the uh, the uh, efficiencies of these materials. And it has to do with just this uh, simple fact you're going to a direct band gap as you shrink down this material to one layer thick. And theory suggests that this could be an ideal. And this, these little transition metal dichalcinides, there's a whole zoo of these materials that have similar properties that can be explored. But what's even more interesting than just the fact that you have this tunable direct band gap is the fact that because of the symmetry inside the system, you can think of energy bands at different locations in the material, and you can actually couple to different energy bands depending on the light that you shine on them. Whether it's right polarized light or left polarized light, you can couple to either, wait, which, all right, the red's right. All right, so you can couple to the red uh, bands or you can couple to the blue bands. Now, you couple that or you combine that with the fact that you know our spins in our valence band or at different energies, and now all of a sudden you have different channels to which you can couple to the electronic states in the materials. And so this is very unique in improving not only the efficiency of the transport of the information, but also information storage. and allows for things like valleytronics and spintronics where you're actually looking at the different valleys and the different spins in the material. And so this is a very rich phase space for us looking at the next generation of optoelectronic devices and storage, and it's all possible with this 
direct band gap. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Superconductivity. So our last little topic today is based on superconductors. Now superconductivity is electrical current without resistance. It's the free flow of electrons and they don't have any interactions with the lattice that would help you know, destroy that energy. It's free flowing without resistance. Now superconductivity was discovered back in 1911. And then in um, 1957, BCS theory came about that kind of explained how these superconductors work. And to think about how a superconductor works is think about our lattice array here. And as the electron is moving through, well then you have this negatively charged electron interacting with these positively charged lattice and the lattice will start to distort. This is that electron phonon coupling, if you will. However, you know, in this scenario, think about, you know, the atoms are moving very slowly to where the electrons are zipping through there very fast. And so as this electron leaves the material, then there is going to be a net positive charge, if you will, right in this area, which is going to attract another electron. And so in this way, these electrons actually will start to pair up and can move through the material without resistance due to the assistance of this phonon, this electron phonon coupling. Now this is how conventional superconductors work. But then in 1986, there was discovery of the cuprates and what we call high TC, high temperature superconductors. Now these materials, the way that they work, yeah, I don't know. It is still a complete mystery today. We don't understand from the most fundamental level how these materials work. Although that doesn't mean we can't do useful things with them still. Nonetheless. And so the material that I'm going to be talking about was actually um, discovered in 2012 by a Chinese group. And it's basically these iron selenide films. Now it says films, but basically bulk iron selenide, thicker materials, a chunk of iron selenide is indeed a superconductor. But the problem is, is the fact that it's superconducting transition temperature is really low to where these films, if you shrink it down to a single unit cell, it's an order of magnitude larger in temperature that you actually have these superconducting properties. Now that's just kind of weird, and we want to understand why that is, and how can we take advantage of that. So these iron-based superconductors, there's a whole you know, zoo of these different superconductors, and they have all of these different crystalline structures, but all of the action all of the superconducting properties lives right inside this iron selenium layer right here. And so as we go through the different materials, you can kind of see the, sh the changes in the shape of the Fermi surface as you actually start putting different amounts of electrons on the iron atoms as they move through the material. So this is how we can actually change the shape of the Fermi surface and see how it interacts and inter you know, uh, changes the properties of the material. Now, ARP has on these iron selenide thin films, angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy. So this is some of our data. And so you can kind of see that if you look at just one layer and even two layers of iron selenide, I, they're different. The electronic structures are just completely different. And so that in itself is sort of strange enough as it is. But then, you know, there was actually something else that kind of appeared that kind of puzzled us a little bit. These little replica bands. Now these replica bands actually reminds me of one of my favorite science quotes by a science fiction writer. The most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. So this is a situation to where this is really, it's not supposed to be there, and it's never been seen before in a solid state material with such clarity. And so, and these are key, are key to what is going on in these materials and how they behave. And so we also did our little trick to where we can sprinkle some potassium on it to, to change how many electrons are in the band structure and actually change the electronic structure. And so if we take something just three layers thick to where it looks like a bulk-like electronic structure, we sprinkle a little potassium on it and all of a sudden we recover this electronic structure of that single unit cell, that single layer thick film. 
The difference is there's no replica bands. Now, the reason I really point that out is because, uh, is because the fact that you know, this is itself is actually a superconductor, and it actually has an enhancement of TC, but it's just not near as big as that single layer thick film is. And so what are these replica bands? We can go back to our, our electron phonon coupling here, but this is a completely different type of electron phonon coupling. In this case, the phonon doesn't come in and just change the direction of the electron. In this particular case, the phonon comes in and just gives a slight kick in energy to the electron, but doesn't change its direction. And this is very unique property. And this is what's generating that replica band, that unique signature inside our material. And so what we have is we have bulk materials that have a very low transition temperature for superconductivity. And then we can kind of sprinkle a few electrons on that, change the electronic structure, and we have some slight enhancement. But then it's coupling with these phonons inside the substrate that is giving this turbo boost, if you will, to the superconducting properties of these materials. Now, this is sort of, of, of unique, and, and you know, just you know, for the experts in the audience, I'd like to kind of push our little analogy with the soccer ball one step further. Because before, when I was talking about superconductors, remember I said that we normally think about the ions moving very slowly, while the electrons move very fast. And so typically, the electrons are at a much higher energy scale than these very low energy lattice vibrations. But in our particular case, in our particular case, the bottom of this band is only about 60 millivolts, while the phonon energy is much higher than that. And so this is a scenario to where the phonon energy scale is actually larger than the electron energy scale. And so that's strange in itself, and there's concerns about our adiabatic approximation, but my theorist friends tell me not to worry, so I'm not gonna worry. Um, so we have a situation to where we can actually control the substrate to where we actually have coupling between the phonons and the oxides that move across the interface and actually couple to the electrons that are moving in this two-dimensional material. And it comes down basically, for the experts, it comes down to screening. Basically, if you have an oxide substrate here to where you have these phonons, you don't have electrons floating around that could screen the oscillation of that charge. And so that means that it gets really amplified and really connects to these electrons flowing in this two-dimensional plane. Now, what's really, really interesting about this is there's nothing special about iron selenide. So our theories will show that it's this anisotropy in the coupling in this dielectric constant that is actually generating this turbo boost for the superconducting properties. So in principle, we can actually stack together a lot of different materials and even think about cuprates and still be able to generate this cross interface coupling between these different parameters, these different players in our material. And so this is sort of the direction that we would like to go with here, with those materials. So um, I see that I'm right now out of time, and I don't want to be you know, any more than fashionably late. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and just, you know, wrap it up here. And so I'm hoping you have a little bit under, better understanding of what this image means. And so, you know, here we actually grow materials via molecular beam epitaxy and then be able to look at them at the electronic structure very precisely using the uh, user facilities here at SSRL. Now, there's one thing that I've kind of, you know, neglected in this study here, and that is theory. So with our theory today, and this is one of the things that sets our age apart from previous ages, is the fact that our theory is becoming ever and ever more sophisticated, and we're combining the theory with a lot of the advances in the information age. We have giant supercomputers, bigger and better, that can calculate more complex systems, and our theory is getting better. So that as we calculate those more complex systems, the answers are even more accurate. And so what we do is we can actually think about a feedback. 
to where we have a theory that can predict a particular material, we can grow the material, and then we can benchmark the theory to see if it's right or not, and use this to do a sort of a rapid materials development to generate the properties that we're looking for. And so what we're doing is we're actually taking the toolbox, the tools that we have that nature has given us, but we're actually generating materials that just don't form in nature. So these are more akin to supernatural materials, if you will. So our program offers insights that will define the next age. And with the exponentially shrinking development cycle between discovery of materials and implementation into devices and such, this age will happen within our lifetimes. Now, in a program like this can really only happen at a national lab to where you can couple the material science division with the actual user facilities here at the national lab. This is your national lab. This is your SLAT and where we're going with it. So now that we're actually here at the end, I thought I'd have a few final thoughts about what the future may hold. Now, I was going to make a joke about, you know, these futuristic machines that you have in science fiction films to where you go up to the computer and you ask for a cup of coffee, a cheese sandwich, and a light bulb, and they all just materialize right in front of you. But then I read an article to where we're starting to make sports cars with 3D printed aluminum parts, and so I'm not even going to try to make any predictions anymore. But now, nature has given us a tremendous toolkit for solving some very tough problems. Everything in your life is touched by fundamental materials research in some way. Now, the rabbit hole is deep. There's a lot we don't understand. Alice has nothing on me or on my colleagues. So as this is you know, a fascinating world to where such few players can actually generate the complexity of everything we see around us. But as we shrink the link scales of our technology and be able to gain efficiency, minimizing cost, minimizing carbon footprints, we're going to shrink down to the two-dimensional limit. Now this is where the electronic structure and the material surfaces and interfaces will dominate the material properties and the physics that we see. And so the fundamental understanding of how the players interact on this level is how we can win the game. And so merging the information age with the material age leading to a materials renaissance and we are just at the dawn of it. And so here at Slack, we're at the forefront of the wave. Our MBE ARPES program is now built. It is completed. You saw the assembly of it, and we already have our first data. So let the games begin. And with the rapid materials development that we see within our lifetimes, it is going to be a fun ride. But now, with regard to what future societies will look like, it's going to be hard. We can see the, the impact we can make on materials and the positive impact we can make on everybody's lives. But predicting future societies is going to be tricky, just as it is with trying to predict Google, Facebook, and Twitter would have been re the results from the discovery and the development of a semiconductor, a transistor. It's hard to say. But now there is one thing I do know about the future. And when that next material age happens, I do know one thing. I know what I'm going to be wearing because I can totally pull that off. <laughs> and so with that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators who worked tirelessly on all this research, and of course our funding agency, the Department of Energy. And with that, I would like to thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. No, thank you. All right, so I guess these are new microphones. We're all figuring out how to do it. So, um, yeah. So, um, yes, we have time for some questions. Now, right now we have these new <laughs> microphones. We would like you to make sure the microphone is working before you ask your question, because this lecture is being recorded. It'll appear on YouTube. And so we'd like to record your question as well as the answer. What you're supposed to do is to push the button in the middle at the bottom and then the microphone, a red button will appear, the microphone will turn on, and then you can ask your question. And please don't do that until you're recognized by the speaker so that we don't have multiple people talking at once. And we'll start with this lady right here. Yes. 
Uh -oh. It's not oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> that works. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, my question is about um, photons. I was wondering, is there a way to measure photons? Because I know that they're like, uh, they're a wave that like propagates through an atom and that uh, there's like the photon push in elements with like electron coupling. So can photons be measured as a, as a entity? Now, it, it actually turns out that photons can be measured as an entity itself. Um, the, the techniques of getting to the point now to where you can actually start looking at to the point of single photon spectroscopy, if you will. Now, a lot of the detectors and things that we use don't go down to that granularity. Now, we do with the electrons, but not with the photons. So our detectors and RPES is detecting one electron at a time. And it, it, it cascades into where we can actually generate the image on the detector. So there we're actually looking at single particle physics to where we're measuring one electron at a time. And so while it is possible to actually measure photons and the techniques that we use, we're not going to quite that granularity for looking at electronic structures. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, so I was wondering, like, what percentage of time currently do you get sort of like a that's funny reaction to your work versus, oh, that did what I expected it to do? Like, I'm just curious, like, like, are you, are how you, off, how yeah, like, happens? as your theory improves, are you, get, are you able to better expect what's going to happen, or is it still at the stage where things are completely unpredictable? Um, well, yes and no, or actually, I guess yes and yes. Um, so this is a situation to where you can kind of see that about two out of three times, something strange happens that we don't understand. <laughs> Um, but our theory is becoming much more sophisticated and much better improved. And so with this, we can actually, you know, start thinking about having theories help us develop materials, which is, you know, sort of what gives us this, this new dawn into the Renaissance because our theory is becoming so sophisticated. But that being what it is, I'm not worried as an experimentalist. You know, I, I, I still have job security because we're always going to find things that just doesn't match the theory that we just don't understand. And so it really depends on how deep you go uh, is, is to, there's always going to be something that, that, you know, the theories in the end are models, if you will, that helps us understand how the materials behave. But there's always going to be properties and there's always going to be aspects that just pop up that we don't yet understand. And so from the very fundamental physics of, of electrons and atoms, there is still so much we don't know. It's a very, very deep rabbit hole. Uh, but it's nonetheless fascinating to investigate. But for a practical sense, for the actual use-inspired materials of actually making things to make devices and useful technologies out of, we're at the point now to where our theory is becoming sophisticated enough that we're having a much more rapid turnaround time for investigating materials and actually the predictive capabilities of new properties of materials. And so the transition metal dichalcogenides was one that was led by theory. Topological insulators is another class of material that's really led by a lot of the theoretical efforts. And so there's now starting to turn, have that turning point to where theory can start leading the development of a lot of new materials. And this is what's new. We're actually to that point now, but that doesn't mean that theory knows it all we're always going to have some cool surprises that they have to figure out. <coughs> yes? Hello? Um, is, is there another mic on? Uh, how does it work? <laughs> After you're done with your mic, can you press the button to turn it off? Is, it looks like it's off. Maybe. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I guess I'll take your question. How about that? <laughs> I'll get yours in a second. Yes. Yeah, it's like gay. Yeah. And my question is, number one, if you can put back the chart with all the materials that shows the temperature on a side, uh, you know how you showed the years versus the temperature. For superconductivity? S right. So oh. most of them are at much lower temperatures than normal room temperature, obviously. Yes. yes. Is that one of the limitations? Now, you know, one of the, the uh, caveats with superconductivity. This one, yes. Yes, this one. And so, yeah, I, I, I kind of glazed over that to get, not go into any detail. But, you know, these temperatures are really cold. Very much cold. Much well below room temperature. <laughs> 
And so the ultimate goal, the ultimate thing that we would love to do is to be able to design and build a, a material that will be a superconductor at room temperature. But we are very far away from that. That's, that's the main limitation, I would assume. That is still, we are very, we're still very far away from that. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that still the, the fundamental mechanism generating the superconductivity, generating the glue that pairs these electrons together so that they can propagate through the material, it's still unknown. That's one of the things we can help. But the hope here and, and the new avenue that we're able to pursue, pursue now is the fact that with this study is we're starting to find new ways to actually enhance some of these properties like superconductivity. And so, you know, for this film, you know, we can actually look at, you know, a, a dramatic superconducting enhancement. And so the idea is can we apply a lot of these techniques and a lot of these ideas to some of these other materials to get the same similar boost in transition temperature. Now, it may not get all the way up to room temperature, but the hope is that we can eventually get something at a high enough temperature to where we can use it for practical devices like you know, uh, uh, energy transport and transmission lines for electricity. Now, just to say that even today, there are some substations and such that are, have current flowing between them using superconducting wires. And so this technology is there today, but because the temperatures are still so low, it's not really widespread. And so this is where we'd like to be, and this is hopefully a path that will help us boost up getting closer to that ultimate goal. Um, actually, I know you, let's see if we get the, still not working, there it is. It, All right. You'll not believe it, but that was my question. Ah, <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Two questions with one answer. Excellent. <laughs> yes. That's a, a pretty interesting machine you have there, and is it, uh, what's the throughput and the cycle time between depositing with molecular uh, epitaxy uh, a, a new material, characterizing it, generating this ARPA's spectrum, and then understanding what that means with decades of, of uh, education, I'm sure, uh, to recognize that something is unusual there. And is there hope to automate that process to, uh, in the same way that in the huge phase space of genetics and biology nowadays, we just do shotgun, uh, shotgun uh, approaches to find interesting things. Do you have hope for that here? And how can I help? We'll probably not go that far. Um, now, there has been a lot of, inf of, of automation in the semiconducting industry for a lot of these, these thin film techniques like molecular beam epitaxy. And so even the different versions of these machines can have robots that move samples in and out and manipulate everything. And so if you actually start trying to think about scaling up a material in order to you know, generate some sort of technological device or something like that, then this is a scalable type of technique to where you can do that because it's, it's already been done once. But now what we do is we actually look at just the very fundamental material properties. And so we pretty much have to do this at a material at a time. And so for each of our materials, it will take a while because you know, the material electronic structure is just so sensitive to the position of the atoms that we have to get really good at controlling the position of those atoms in a particular material before we actually look at it in our ARPES you know, in station. And so from that perspective, you know, it'll take quite a long time to look at a particular material system and for us to investigate the electronic structure. And so for us, it's, it's a bit more labor intensive because it's a material at a time, but we're really learning how to control the electronic structure. And once we do that, and once we have that knowledge, then that could be directly transferable out into industry in order to generate you know, new materials for new devices. But for example, what's the cycle time for one sample? I, you know, there it's hard to say. I mean, because it's, it's just for some of our samples, you know, for, uh, you know, in this little guy here, the couch and I have molecular beam epitaxy system. Um, it's a, it looks like a, a small baby MBE system, so we call it Bambi. Um, so in this system, to grow a film, it takes 30 seconds. And so then it'll take, you know, maybe a few hours to map out the electronic structure. But now some of the more complicated structures like, you know, heterostructures made of titanates and cuprates, you know, we're spending months trying to figure out how to get these pieces of the puzzle to fit together precisely enough before we even stick it into the beam line and take a look at it. 
And so there, but once we develop those recipes, and, and we've done this with, with a lot of different header structures of some titanates and, and cuprates, once we develop the recipes, it's a matter of growing a material in an hour and then taking a couple hours to actually look at the electronic structure. But that's only after months of developing of the material itself. Very good. Let's just take two more questions. So anyone? Yes. Ch change of subject. Uh, the pictures of people working on the gear at the end, yes. uh, they all had purple gloves on. Yes. What happens if you don't use the gloves? Uh, we don't get the vacuum we need. <laughs> so we work under ultra high vacuum conditions. And just like I was saying before to where if you actually have a material, any atmospheric contaminants, you know, moisture, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, anything like that can actually sit on the material. It may not affect the material, but it will interact with those electrons as they come out and destroy the signal that we're looking for. And so in order to actually do this technique, to have the electrons come out of the material and into the detector, we have to pump out all of the air. And we actually have to get to ultra high vacuum conditions on the order of 10 to the minus 11 tor. Now I think in the middle of space, I think it's 10 to the minus 13 tor. And so it's, it's you know, incredibly low vacuums, no atmosphere whatsoever inside those chambers. Now in order for us to actually reach that, we have to make sure that we don't have fingerprints. Any of our oils, as soon as you start pumping it out, it just outgasses. And so we have to make sure we keep the insides of these chambers and everything absolutely pristine clean. And after we assemble it, we actually wrap this whole thing up and bake it. We actually raise the temperature of this entire system all the way up to 150 degrees Celsius or about 300 degrees Fahrenheit just because water is a polar molecule, and so it likes to stick to everything. And so we actually have to heat these things up to actually get even the water off of the walls so that our pumps can pump it out in order for us to achieve the vacuum levels that we need. And so the purple gloves are just to make sure that we don't contaminate the inside of the chamber or any of those you know, components on the chamber that would prevent us from actually achieving the vacuum levels that we need in order to actually develop these materials. Yes. Um, back to that superconductor uh, chart. Okay. You didn't talk at all about the thing way up in the upper right corner, which looked like it was getting close to room temperature, that green dot in the upper right. What's um, that? That is, yeah. And the reason for that is, let's see if I can do this real quick. We can just take this guy and move it out of the way, and you can kind of see that this is still, ah, you've got to be kidding me. Minus 50. Did I really so. just do that? That was 200 Kelvin that you saw up there. And so it's still you know, significantly below room temperature. It's, it's still well below. And so you know, it's something to where, you know, it's one of those things that we'd like to achieve, but it's something to where we're gonna have to find the tricks in order to actually have this quantum coherent state live at such high temperatures. Because a lot of the exotic properties that we see, they're easy to appear at very low temperatures. These are the ground state, basically, the lowest energy level configuration of the materials themselves. But once you start adding heat to it, then a lot of times you can scramble a lot of these quantum mechanical states. And so the trick is, is how can we actually enhance these quantum mechanical states and so that they survive at higher temperatures? And that, how to do that is, is the $64,000 question. And so by learning how to couple a lot of these different properties together across interfaces and such like that, we can help to try to find ways to enhance these quantum mechanical properties. And so these ground states, these exotic properties that we see survive at much higher temperatures that can be much you know, useful for applications. And superconductivity is a perfect example of that. So it's gonna be a long time before we start having you know, superconductors in our cell phones and in our lights and stuff like that. But this is something to where if we could boost the TC up, we could start thinking about you know, just electricity transmission over great distances. Because I think uh, about, what is it, seven to 10% of the total electricity that's made in the world is just wasted. It just floats off into space as heat. Because as you start moving current through the wires, the resistance in the wire just generates waste heat and it just gets wasted. And so if we could find you know, a way to transmit large amounts of current without that resistance, the world will forever be a different place. So that's the ultimate goal, but we are still quite a ways away from it. 
but we're starting to understand the players and how they interact with each other to give us hopes of being able to develop those materials. Okay, let's thank Rob again. Okay, thank you. So um, Rob wants to clean up here, but he'll be out in the lobby in just a minute if you have more questions. He'll be out there, you can ask him privately. The next one of these lectures will be in November, the week before Thanksgiving. We'll tell you how to discover dark matter with large tanks of liquid xenon. So we hope to see you there, and thank you very much for coming tonight.